Hi guys, Olive here, here today to discuss two different books on climate and environmental issues. The first of the two books that I'll be discussing in today's video is How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, The Solutions We Have and the Breakthroughs We Need by Bill Gates. This book was published in 2021 by Knopf, which is a division of Penguin Random House, and the hardcover comes in at 272 pages. However, I read this book as an ebook that I access through my library. I probably don't have to tell you who Bill Gates is, but I will very briefly anyway. Bill Gates is the co-founder of the enormous software company, Microsoft. He had an active role in the company up until 2008 when he stepped down as CEO. And then in 2020, he actually also stepped down from the company's board of directors. Over the past decade or so, Bill Gates has definitely been transitioning away from having any kind of a role at Microsoft and into working full time at his foundation that he has with his wife, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's definitely been more interested in being an investor and a philanthropist, doing work through this foundation foundation, which is said to be one of the biggest private foundations anywhere in the world. The Gateses have invested tens of billions of their own dollars into this foundation. And that kind of primes me to talk about something that Gates himself notes at the beginning of this book, and that's the fact that he's not a climate scientist. He's just a really rich guy. And I know we're all very used to the fact that rich, famous guys think that simply by being rich and famous, they're allowed to widely broadcast their opinion on anything and everything. We're very used to that. But that's not exactly the case with Bill Gates. Bill Gates became involved in the climate change discussion in kind of an indirect, accidental way. He and his wife run this foundation, and their core purpose is the eradication of poverty. So they've traveled to a lot of developing countries. They've tried to learn more about what people are going through and learn more about potential solutions that they can invest in. And Bill Gates started to notice a relationship between the potential economic success of people in developing countries and their access to energy. But then around the same time, people with ideas for startups started to approach Bill Gates and wondered if they could have some seed money to start these companies that would address climate change in some way. And so because of those two things, Bill Gates' desire to bring more energy resources to developing countries without having any kind of an impact on the climate and directly investing in a lot of these companies to solve those problems he started to become more informed. He has also talked to a lot of people. He's Bill Gates. Most people would take that phone call. So while he is just a rich guy and not a trained climate scientist, he is very well informed in a very interdisciplinary way. Bill Gates has also been doing a whole lot of putting his money where his mouth is. He has invested in so many different businesses and technologies that will help us reduce emissions. So while that doesn't necessarily entitle him to an opinion on this and doesn't entitle him to write a book on this, I do think it's important to know about him that he has definitely done the research, not just for himself, but because he has money invested in this. He's also very comfortable telling you throughout this book what money he's put where and whether or not it was a good investment. The core purpose of this book, Bill Gates's central message, what he wants to communicate above anything else in this book, is that we as humans need to go from emitting 51 billion tons of climate changing greenhouse gases annually the whole way down to zero if we're even going to slow down the climate changes that are still likely to happen. But before he can give us a roadmap of how we're going to achieve that goal, he has to break down where all those emissions are coming from. They come from making electricity, making things, growing things, getting around, and heating and cooling. He then gives us the percentage breakdown of how much each of those categories make up that 51 billion annual tons total, so we know where we really should be focusing. But the whole time he's going through each of those categories, he keeps that central goal in mind getting to zero. You will read how we get to zero approximately 51 billion times within this book. Getting to zero. This will get us to zero. This won't get us to zero. We have to get to zero. Each of those categories, so making electricity, making things, growing things, they all get their own chapters within this book. And in each of those chapters, Bill Gates discusses how precisely carbon, carbon dioxide, is emitted from certain activities that go into those categories. And even if you know a lot about climate science, 
I think you will, like I was, be really surprised that certain activities emit carbon. When he's discussing those carbon emitting activities, he does take a moment to talk about whether or not there is currently an alternative method for doing that activity that doesn't emit carbon. And if there isn't currently an alternative, he acknowledges that there is a gap and says that we need to invest in research and development in order to find one. He also discusses those clean alternatives. And I should note that clean just means that it doesn't contribute to climate change. It doesn't mean that that alternative doesn't have any dangerous byproducts or negative effects. It just means that it doesn't emit carbon. So he discusses those clean alternatives and why, if they're available for us right now, we're not using them, which often boils down to cost. And this is where I need to step in as a reviewer because there's something very important I think you should know about this book if you're considering reading it. I think there are a lot of nitty gritty details in this book that will not interest you unless you are a specific type of person. Let me explain what I mean by that. So just using me as an example, I took some college classes just for fun. I'm a geek, more on that later. One of those was a class called Natural Resource Economics, and we were trying to determine at what point a business would choose to use a recycled material over a raw material. And we were plotting the cost and figuring out kind of the sweet spot at which a business would choose to use something that's recycled, how much the raw material would have to rise in price before they made that choice. I found that very interesting. I have also studied accounting, I've worked in pricing, and so cost and how it motivates businesses and consumers is something that I find fascinating. If those are not things that interest you, I think you will find large sections of this book tedious. Just for instance, there is this whole discussion in the making things section where he talks about making things like concrete and how that emits a ton of carbon and there's really no way around it that we can see right now. But then making things like plastics, even though they contribute to environmental degradation in other ways, they don't emit carbon when we make them because the carbon is so stored within the plastic. If that sounds interesting to you, you will like this book. If that bores you to tears, you will not like a lot of this book. But what does make this book incredibly approachable is the tone that Bill Gates adopts throughout it. I mean, there are some pretty big concepts in this book. We're talking about cutting edge technology that's meant to solve arguably the biggest problem humanity has ever faced. But Bill Gates keeps his language very simple, and he gives us very understandable examples that put those big concepts into context. I think what I loved most about this book, though, is that throughout it, he never loses sight of the first and core focus of his foundation, and that's the eradication of poverty. He never forgets people in the developing world. He keeps saying throughout the book that getting us to zero doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing all the things we're doing right now. It's all about finding sustainable ways to do what we do right now, to do what we do right now, but not emit any more carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And also getting to zero doesn't mean that we deprive the developing world of things that we have in the developed world. I 100% agree with him in his point that we in the developed world don't morally have the right to tell people in the developing world that they don't get to have access to energy and resources that will make their lives better, that will make them more economically prosperous. He also talks in the book about how it will be poor people who pay the highest price for even small changes in the climate and how we need to be preparing right now to avoid exactly what the title says, a climate disaster. If you get to the core of what this book really is, I would say it's a guideline of what needs to happen over the next decade or two if we're going to be even partially prepared for whatever awaits us climate-wise. He does give some suggestions of what you can do on an individual level, but he makes it clear that it's mainly governments who need to be working on this and they need to be working on it together. He is optimistic throughout this book that we can find solutions where they don't already exist. We can implement existing solutions and make them even better. His tone throughout the book is very motivating and hopeful. When it comes to my personal reaction to this book, overall, I really enjoyed it. I like those nitty gritty details, so that did not get in my way. 
I really admire his dedication to this issue. I think he brought up a lot of really good ideas throughout the book that made me think I had never thought of those types of things before. So that's always good. And I also appreciated that he thought of people that I've seen a lot of other climate change books ignore, like people who work in or adjacent to the fossil fuel industries. He considered how we're going to have to support them as we make these transitions. I thought that was really great. I will say though that Bill Gates is a whole lot more optimistic about this issue than I am. I know that a lot of people are going to purchase this book and read this book even just based off of name recognition and I have some mixed feelings about that because I think this is a good book. I think it's worth reading but I do think a lot of people are going to be turned off by those nitty-gritty details that I spoke about earlier and I also don't think it's a very good place to start with this issue. It would not be a book I recommend be someone's first book about climate change. It wouldn't even be my recommendation for someone's second or third book about climate change. I always hope that people watch my reviews and find value in them, of course, but I'm actually really hoping that a lot of people who are considering buying this book see this review first, because I don't think it's immediately clear when you look at the cover or read the synopsis that this is very industry focused. If that's your kind of thing, then this will be directly up your alley. If not, there are other places to start. But now onto the second environmental book that's having a moment right now. That book is called Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future by Elizabeth Colbert. This book was also published in 2021, but by Crown Publishing, which is a subsidiary of Penguin Random House. The hardcover of this book comes in at 256 pages. I also read this book as an ebook, but I got this one for free for reviewing purposes through Neck Alley. Elizabeth Colbert is a longtime staff writer for The New Yorker. She's also the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sixth Extinction. And in this book, she looks at a number of different human created environmental issues and what certain scientists are attempting to do about them. Climate change is discussed in this book toward the end of the book, and it's also where the title comes from, but it is hardly this book's focus. Elizabeth Colbert talks about a number of different things throughout this book's three sections. For instance, she talks about invasive species of carp and how people are desperately trying to keep them out of the Great Lakes. She talks about how portions of southern Louisiana, partially because of flood mitigation, are starting to sink. There's one chapter that's focused on an entirely conservation-dependent species of desert fish. There are two about genetic experimentation. One of them is about efforts to create a more heat-tolerant coral reef, whereas the other one is about using technology to manipulate the genes of a different invasive species. And then finally, that last section talks about some pretty radical ideas that people have to combat climate change, which won't be all that unfamiliar to you if you read this book after How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, as I did. That's pretty much the structure of this entire book. There is no introduction. She just goes straight into it. I really appreciated that she missed me with the whole, let's talk about COVID-19 because my publisher says I have to thing that Bill Gates did. And I'm sure every other nonfiction book I'll be reading this year will do. I don't need to hear it a million times. She does mention the pandemic very briefly at the end of the book where she talked about how she couldn't travel to a place one more time when she thought she would be able to. And that affected her ability to kind of close out that section. But that's it. Colbert also seems to make a point to not involve herself too much in these stories. You know that she's present, you know that she's there meeting with these people, talking with these people, getting their stories to write this book, but she doesn't insert herself where it's not appropriate. So her thumbprint really isn't on this book, except for the fact that it's all over her writing, which is exactly where it should be. There's a command that she has over the storytelling that's really hard to describe. It's hard to put it in words but it just feels really solid and trimmed of all of the fat, not just some of the fat, all of the fat. It is so lean. It's really short. It zooms by, but you don't feel like you've missed anything. This author has a great sense of humor and she has great observational skills, 
but she knows what she came there to do and she just does it. These are concise, effective stories of these scientists and the work that they're doing. She'll throw in background information and give you any additional information you may need to fully understand the work that these people are doing, but there are really no tangents, no digressions. She just does the thing. I appreciated this book so much for that. If you've been around my channel for any length of time, you'll know that I appreciate brevity. I don't want anything in a book that doesn't need to be there. This book delivered everything that needed to be there and nothing else. And I loved it for that. So while I liked How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, I liked this one more. And that's also partially because I didn't feel that the author was forcing herself to put a smile on her face while discussing this issue just to give the reader a sense of optimism. I felt that it was gloomier, but not excessively so. I thought it was very appropriate because it felt more realistic. I'm not accusing Bill Gates of being inauthentic much. I do think he is an optimist, but I think he portrayed himself as a lot cheerier on paper than he actually feels. But Colbert pulls absolutely no punches in this book. I highlighted so many passages that just knocked the wind out of me because she trimmed all the fat. Her words are so potent. I don't have any criticisms of this book. I thought it was fantastic. It gets in there, does what it sets out to do, then gets out again. There are no frills. It's just great writing and really interesting information. I mean, the section where she's talking about Louisiana and how you need floods to create more land and how not having those floods is actually causing it to sink. I was geeking out so hard. I've not geeked out that much about a science book since I read and reviewed I Contain Multitudes many years ago. In short, this was a five-star read for me. And if you couldn't tell, it's definitely my favorite out of these two. I enjoyed both of these books. I would recommend both of them, but for very different reasons. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend either of them if you're just looking to get started reading about climate change. If you're looking for recommendations of where you can start, or if you're looking for recommendations of more books like these, if you liked one or both of these books, please do check out my further reading section in the description box below where I'll recommend some titles. So that's it for this dual review video. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen in this video or about anything in general, please feel free to put that in the comment section below. But if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on social media and the links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.